Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Dr. Georgios Milotis. I'm an assistant professor at the School of Medicine at the University of Galway. And it's a pleasure to be able to present as part of the 10th annual Microbiology Week virtual event series. The title of my talk is The Oral Microbiome in Mental Health Disorders. And it's a work we have been doing in our lab for quite a while. So we're going to go through two different chapters. And I hope you find the presentation interesting. Before we start, just to say that this presentation includes discussions on major depressive disorder and schizophrenia, which may contain content related to mental illness, depression, suicidal thoughts, and psychosis. So this information might be distressing or triggering for some individuals. Please prioritize your mental health and well-being. And below, you'll find some US-based resources if you need immediate assistance. If you're joining us from Ireland, uh, this is the Irish HSC Mental Health Helpline. So please call there if you require assistance. A few words for in relation to where I'm joining from today. So as I've mentioned, I'm joining from the University of Galway. This is based in Europe, uh, in Ireland. So at the very edge of the island, on the west side, the west coast. It's a city of about 200 to 300,000 people. It's a beautiful place. So. I strongly advise you to visit uh, if you haven't done so already. And there we have the University of Galway, which is quite a large university and quite an old university as well. It was established back in the 1840s. And we are very, it's a very vibrant city, it's a very lovely student city. So as I said, if you haven't, please make sure you do visit. In terms of the presentation itself, itself as I've mentioned, it's one would look at at the oral microbiome in major depressive disorder, a work we have been doing particularly in the case of young adults. And the second chapter will look at the oral microbiome in the case of schizophrenia. Particularly, we will focus on the case of a specific antipsychotic called clozapine. So we can start off chapter one, uh, the oral microbiome in major depressive disorder. To say this study has been funded by Interreg, which is a European Union fund that it served between Northern Ireland, Ireland and Scotland, and it was led by Ulster University. So a little bit of background as to what MDD is. MDD can be very easily described as a mental health pandemic. It's estimated that around the globe, over 264 million people are affected by major depressive disorder. And if we look at it from a monetary perspective, particularly in the European Union, it costs the EU economy about 170 billion euros, which is approximately the same in dollars a year. And that's the total cost of mood disorders and anxiety. If we look at it from an Irish perspective, uh, we are a country of about 5 million people. So it's estimated that 450,000 people in the Republic of Ireland are affected at some point in their lives by major depressive disorder. If we look at it from Northern Ireland, which is an adjacent uh, nation, it's one in nine. And if we take into consideration all mental health illnesses in the Republic of Ireland, it relates to about 18.5% of our population. If we look at it from uh, a different metric, which is suicide attempts, in the Republic of Ireland, it's estimated that this affects one every 28 people. So whether we look at it from a global perspective, a local perspective, um, or any perspective, major depressive disorder, it's a very serious uh, mental health issue that affects many people in Europe, in the US, and around the world. To treat MDD, we usually prescribe a class of medication called antidepressants. And here I have the statistics for three different countries, the United States, the Republic of Ireland, and Northern Ireland. What you'll see is that at any given time, approximately in the US and uh, the Republic of Ireland, 10 to 12% of the population are on antidepressants. And this is about one in four for Northern Ireland. So quite a lot of people. In relation to how MDD comes about, how MDD develops, from a neuroscience perspective, there are several hypotheses that have been brought forward over the years, and the kind of three parts. So we have the monoamine hypothesis, the cytokine hypothesis, 
and the neurotrophic hypothesis. But overall, there is not a scientific consensus as to which of the three really leads to the development of MDD and maybe a combination as well. Those have mentioned to treat MDD and diagnosis of MDD is very complicated, but to treat it, we do give antidepressants and we know how antidepressants work. They act by increasing neurotransmitter concentrations in the synaptic cleft. But what we also know is that they don't work for everyone. So 10 to 30% of people on antidepressants saw no response. Overall, what is very evident when we look, whether we look at etiology or whether we look at treatment is that there are known mechanisms at play in MDD and the microbiome, it's a key mechanism that we're going to look into, particularly the oral microbiome in our case. So, for those of you who may not be familiar with the term, the, the term microbiome refers to the collection of microbial communities that inhabit our bodies. And at any given time, we are outnumbered three to one, meaning we have three times more microbial cells than we have human cells in our own bodies. So from a philosophical perspective, I suppose you can think of it that way. So are we just simply a vehicle for the numerous bacteria that inhabit our microbiome? Or given that there's so many more compared to human ones in terms of hosting us. So as we go through the presentation today, you may realize that who is driving here, it's uh, maybe in the gray area and we don't really understand it. So for the first study, what we did in terms of methodology, it was fairly straightforward. So we collected saliva from individuals and we extracted the DNA, which we then used for deep shotgun metagenomic sequencing. We bioinformatically processed the results and we looked at then the compositional and functional differences comparing two cohorts, one cohort being uh, people on major depressive disorder and the other cohort being healthy controls. Just to clarify one thing here, how the MDD cohort was selected. The MDD cohort was selected based on survey responses to seven questions corresponding to DSM-4 criteria for depression using a Likert scale response and controls were matched for age, gender, ethnicity, and smoking status. So this is our methodology. And our hypothesis was a fairly straightforward one again. So we know that the gut microbiome, which is the microbial community inhabiting our gut, is directly affecting mood, is directly affecting brain health. And we know that through a series of animal studies, through a series of human studies as well, and the connection happens through the vagus nerve. So the gut microbiome is directly linked to the brain through the vagus nerve. What's happening to the oral microbiome? It's a different story. The oral microbiome is very close to the brain. It's very diverse on its own, but we don't really understand how the oral microbiome plays a role, whether that is in major depressive disorder or other mental health illnesses. So what has been hypothesized before is that there must be a link through inflammation. So oral microbiome dysbiosis, which is a non-optimal oral microbiome, could lead to systemic inflammation, could lead to uh, metabolite disturbances, and that could then lead to systemic changes and could in turn, in turn then affect uh, mental health in some way. So overall, what has been proposed is what we call the gut oral brain axis, meaning that we cannot really understand the role the microbiome plays in mental health if we don't take into consideration the link between the gut and oral microbiome as well. So in terms of results, the first two things we looked at is, of course, alpha and beta diversity in terms of the oral microbiome composition. And I have here the two cohorts and they're split between smoking status as well, because we know for a fact, as you can imagine, that smoking will profoundly affect the composition of the oral microbiome. So therefore, we're correcting for it. So the key findings out of that are that depression seems to significantly decrease alpha diversity. And this what practically means is that you have a less diverse microbiome, oral microbiome, less number of species. And this is usually a sign of a suboptimal state. 
or dysbiosis, as we call it. The other thing we noted is that smoking significantly increases alpha diversity, um, quite dramatically, actually. But this is something we're currently looking into, and we don't have a good hypothesis as to why that could be the case here. But regardless of the smoking status, the take-home message out of that slide is that depression seems to make the oral microbiome less diverse. In terms of beta diversity, we did not send specific clustering. But as you will see later on, when we go to the species level resolution, this is kind of expected because the differences we noted were quite subtle. So they wouldn't be captured in a beta diversity graph. In terms of overall composition, I have here two parts, phylum level and genus level in terms of microbiome composition. And the reason I have this slide is to showcase that the usual genera and phyla expected in saliva, which is the part of the oral cavity specimen we collected, they, they contain the genera and phyla that you expect in terms of characterizing the oral microbiome. So in terms of genus, uh, Prevotella, Streptococcus, Velionella, and so on. So the key inhabitants of the microbiome are there. Now, if we look at actual differences, and the differences that passed are very strict statistical criteria to be characterized as such, we did note very subtle differences, but they were there. And those relate to these few bacterial species that they were differentially abundant between the major depressive disorder cohort and the healthy control cohort. So I will highlight a few because they, we think they bear some significance. So one is Acinetobacter baumanniae. And we're quite surprised to see that, but practically what we noted, and that was consistent, is that this species is practically almost absent from the oral microbiome of the major depressive disorder cohort. This is the largest difference we saw in terms of relative abundance. And then we have a couple of other species, Cropenstedia burnea and Streptococcus infantarius. Those two were almost exclusively present in the major depressive disorder cohort. Another thing of note is, and before I, I explain, part maybe is worth mentioning that our microbiome is producing a lot of the neurotransmitters that affect our mood. So GABA being one, serotonin being another. So this bacterial species, Bacteroides fragilis, which is way less abundant, significantly less abundant in the case of major depressive disorder in the oral microbiome, it's a GABA producer. So it's producing a neurotransmitter that directly affects mood. And it appears to be less prevalent in the case of MDD. So overall, what we did then is we took this data we had and we tried to propose uh, whether we can have a consortium that's associated with major depressive disorder in the case of oral microbiome. So again, very strict statistical thresholds were applied here. And what we identified was a consortium composed of three bacterial species. Streptococcus infantarius, Cropenstedia brunea, which seem to work synergistically, and Acinetobacter baumanniae, which is an antagonist of the two. So this consortium overall appears unique to the MDD cohort, and the control cohort shows no strong co-occurrence networks of significant bacterial species at the same threshold applied here. In terms of functional differences, which is the second part we could look uh, when you employ a shotgun metagenomic study, there were two key take-home messages. One was that xenobiotic biodegradation pathways were significantly, significantly less abundant in the case of major depressive disorder. And by ter the term xenobiotics, we mean antibiotics, antipsychotics, any substance that it's not part of the human body or the human body cannot make, so it's foreign and therefore needs to be metabolized. So practically what this implies is that the oral microbiome is in a state where it cannot metabolize xenobiotics as well in the case of major depressive disorder, which can in turn lead to potential inflammation and toxicity. 
And the second pathway that seemed to be downregulated in terms of gene abundance, that is, that was the quorum sensing pathway. Quorum sensing pathway is a very important one, and it's very important for microbiome host dialogue. We know silencing it is known to be implicated with disease and systematic inflammation. So those two pathways overall were the ones that appear to be significantly more downregulated in the case of major depressive disorder. So to summarize chapter one, the oral microbiome in major depressive disorder seems to have certain compositional differences. We do propose a consortium of three species that it appears to have some particular importance in the case of MDD. And we did note signs of oral dysbiosis, which was evident by both alpha diversity changes and functional alterations. So those are the three take home messages from our study. And that concludes chapter one. And I'm going to move on to chapter two, which is a different study. And this is funded by the Irish Research Council. The overall study is called Beacon, and it's run by the University of Galway. So this relates to the oral microbiome in schizophrenia. And this is a little bit different here because we didn't take a culture independent approach, meaning we didn't use shotgun metagenomics, though we will. This is a culture dependent approach. And I will explain what I mean now in a second. So schizophrenia is a little bit different. It's way less prevalent in the population than uh, major depressive disorder. Its prevalence is about 0.5 to 1%. And it appears to cost the European Union economy 29 billion euros a year or so. In terms of symptomology, we group schizophrenia symptoms in three parts, positive, negative, and cognitive with positive symptoms, including hallucinations and delusions, negative symptoms, including flattened effect, abolition, and social withdrawal, and cognitive symptoms, including impairment to memory, reasoning, and attention. About 30% of people who develop schizophrenia are going to go on and develop something called treatment-resistant schizophrenia. And what do I mean by that? So everybody who is diagnosed with schizophrenia and the criteria for diagnosing schizophrenia are much more clear cut compared to the ones used to diagnose major depressive disorder. They, the patients are, are then put on antipsychotics. So treatment resistant schizophrenia relates to this type of schizophrenia where you have persistence of the symptoms you see here, despite two or more appropriate trials with two different antipsychotics. So this happens in about 30% of patients. And then we use a last resort antipsychotic, which is, seems to work well for TRS. And this is clozapine. So clozapine is a last resort antipsychotic utilized specifically in cases of TRS, which is 30% approximately of overall cases of schizophrenia. So I'll take a step back to talk a little bit more about the oral microbiome because it will help understand what I'm going to explain next. So the oral microbiome, as I've mentioned before, is very diverse and it's unique and has over 1000 bacterial species identified so far. So Enterobacterales are not part of the human oral microbiome database. So they're not part of the normal composition of the oral microbiome. And when present in the oral cavity, their presence has been linked to oral and systemic diseases. As I've mentioned before, links between the oral microbiome and depressive-like symptoms have already been explored. No studies to date have looked at links between antipsychotic use and the oral microbiome, and that's the part we're going to discuss now. An important mention before we move on. When somebody on clozapine gets an infection, of course, the person is then put on antibiotics. Clozapine, though, has certain limitations. When you're on clozapine, certain uh, antibiotic classes like quinolones, macrolides, and trimethoprime cannot really be used effectively because they cross-react with clozapine. And some of them are actually with even fatal consequences. My point here is that when you're on clozapine and you have an infection, your treatment options in terms of antibiotics are already more limited. And the other thing to mention is that when the oral microbiome works suboptimally, meaning it's in dysbiosis, 
we do have systemic issues. We do have systemic diseases that we know they occur in uh, reliance to the oral microbiome dysbiosis. And those include neurological, respiratory, cardiovascular, uh, malignancies, and so on. So this study was based on the premise that patients on clozapine appear to be disproportionately affected by infections, particularly of infections of pulmonary nature. So that's the part we're trying to understand. That's the part we're trying to explore. This is very well documented, but we don't really have a good hypothesis as to why. So our hypothesis was that patients on clozapine will have a high prevalence of oral colonization with pathobionts, with things like enterobacterialis, with things that they should not be there as part of their oral microbiome. So in other words, opportunistic pathogens. So here what we did, we collected saliva and we screened on selective agar plates and we preliminary identified the bacteria using MALDI. We then sequenced and we conducted genomic analysis of what we identified. And an important thing to mention here is that apart from sample collection, we do collect a lot of metadata. Every patient is being interviewed. We get a PANS scale assessment, which assesses the psychosis levels. So we're not just collecting saliva, we're collecting a lot of metadata as well. So how does our cohort look like? In the first round, which is the round I'm talking about today, because there's a second round going on at the moment, 45 patients were recruited and we identified 23 patients colonized with uh, pathobionts, with non-transient bacteria in the oral cavity. And 10 patients were then multicolonized, meaning they were colonized with more than one species. So how does this compare? Overall colonization rate for the clozapine cohort for enterobacterialis was 51%. This compares to 5% for health individuals and about 60% for immunocompromised individuals where you expect the colonization rate to be very high because you have an immune system that doesn't function in an optimal state. Those are our demographics. And an important consideration here relates to the antidepressant use. So about 50% of people on clozapine were also on antidepressants. And we count for that because we want to make sure that any change we see come from the use of antipsychotics and not from the use of antidepressants. And this is the clozapine dosage in the cohort in terms of range and standard deviation. So the first thing we looked at relates to antimicrobial resistance genes. So we wanted to see the genomes we had collected from enterobacterials enterobacterialis in the oral cavity of patients on clozapine, what was the resistom like? So we identified that the resistom was mostly intrinsic, meaning that most of the antimicrobial resistance genes were part of the chromosome of the species, and we did note a species-specific clustering. But overall, what we noted as well is that the antimicrobial resistance genes were quite narrow, meaning we didn't have a big diversity of ARGs. So then what we did is we looked at it from a 3D and MDS perspective. So here you have the grouping of every genome we collected, colored per species. And as I've said before, as I explained in the previous slide, we do have this species specific clustering, which is due to most ARGs being intrinsic. But where it became more uh, interesting in terms of genomics is in relation to virulence factors. So we did again note it as species specific clustering, but the virulence of these pathobionts appear to be much more wide compared to the resistance. And that's quite interesting if you consider the pulmonary infection rate that we see in the case of clozapine. So as before, we did a 3D and MDS plot and the same concept as before in resistance genes here for virulence factors, we did note a species specific clustering, but the virulence here seems to play a key role. So for the next and the last part, I'm going to just give you a few specific examples of what the isolates we see in the oral cavity uh, 
of this cohort actually look like. And some of them are publications we already have, and some of them are currently under review. So this is, for example, one isolate we detected. It's E. coli of sequence type 1 to 7. And we identify that to possess 51 antimicrobial resistance genes and 84 virulence factors for mobilizable plasmids. And the features of note are again down to the virulence factors. So we did note hypervirulence associated siderophores like Yersinia bactin and terbactin. And we did note virulence factors that aid in blood brain barrier invasion. So overall, uh, from a genomic perspective, an isolate that carries high virulence potential identified in the oral cavity of a patient on clozapine. So the second example relates to Pantoea pearsoniae. And this was the first complete genome of that species that we identified. So this is a novel human pathogen. It was first reported from internal surfaces on the International Space Station. And again, the same concept as before, a quite narrow resistance and a wide virulence. Three non-mobilizable plasmids, and again, a hypervirulent plasmid carrying the Cidera for aerobactin. And the last example relates to another E. coli isolate of ST73 with two plasmids. And there we noted 194 virulence factors. But what was interesting in that case is when we mapped the location of the virulence factors, they were all mapped in a 274 KB genomic island, which we hadn't noted before. And the pathogenicity islands for three human hypervirulence associated siderophores were also there. So salmokilin, aerobactin, and yersiniabactin, and then acquired antimicrobial resistance genes in this case, in this case, but only a blood M1, which is a narrow spectrum beta lactamase. So overall, the notion relates to the fact that most of the isolates we see within this cohort have a very high genomic virulence potential and a rather limited resistance potential. So currently what we're investigating uh, is hints that we have that patients that come into the clinic at the same day or different days, they could be co-carrying exactly the same uh, pathobionts. And that's very interesting because in that case, there is something we can do about it. So one example we have here is a case of Citrobacter coceri, and it was identified between two patients that were recruited and provided the saliva sample on exactly the same day. And as you see, as before, six antimicrobial resistance genes and 86 virulence factors. Important to mention that due to uh, how close up in works, patients are required to attend the clinic once a month for monitoring. So these patients always go once a month into the clinic. And the second case relates to serratia liquefaciens with six antimicrobial resistance genes, 52 virulence factors. And these two isolates were identified in patients providing saliva sample on different days in this instance. So overall, to summarize chapter two, Patients on clozapine appear to exhibit a high level, 51% in the first study, is even higher in the second study, of colonization with pathobions. In this case, we mean Enterobacterialis in the oral cavity. Genome analysis reveals a narrow antimicrobial resistance gene content and plasmidome, but wide virulence factor profile of pathobions. In terms of the narrow plasmidome, the narrow uh, distribution of plasmids that we see. There is a hypothesis around that, and this relates to the fact that Enterobacterialis are non are, are transient in the oral cavity, they're not native. Therefore, most of their plasmids, they will be incompatible. They won't be able to exchange mobile genetic elements with the oral microbiome uh, healthy cohort of bacteria. And preliminary findings overall hint at sharing of pathobionts between patients, which is something we're very closely monitoring and we're doing more work on. So with that, I'll just like to thank a few people, uh, to thank all studies participants, first and foremost, uh, 
thank the lead researcher Francesca McDonough and a series of other people that you see here that they have helped immensely with the study or have led the studies before but also the closure clinic nursing staff at the University Hospital Galway the adult acute mental health unit staff at the University Hospital Galway and thank you all for listening and here is my email if there are any questions or any recommendations and thank you all very much